Please open your Bibles with me. So the great joy of returning to our beloved pastor, 1 John, and his letter. 1 John, we're going to begin reading back from last time we were together in chapter 2, verse 29, because I want to give us, I want to set in our minds the remembrance or reminders of the context we're under. So we'll begin in chapter 2, verse 29. Our, our scriptures for today are going to be chapter 3, verses 4 to 10. But let's begin in chapter 2, 29. The Word of God says to us, If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now for today, verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. And no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one would deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. May the Lord bless this reading. Father in heaven, we come to you in great need. We cannot of our own natural selves understand what you are saying. So we ask humbly, Father, that the Spirit of God would come, teach, illuminate, examine, comfort, strengthen, correct, convict, edify, do the work, Lord, that you desire for your body, your church, we ask. In the name, the precious name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. As I said, I wanted to include the passage from last time just to remind us where we are in John's letter. And this, this theme of God is righteous. God alone begets righteous children. And verse 28 was what we looked at last time briefly was John, the conclusion of, of what I described as that first ascent of this spiral staircase, looking at the theme, the truth of God is light. And John, John ascended this staircase with us. He took us up each step examining all the various facets of this theme of God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. And he expounded on all the various manifestations, the purposes of this light of God, our need to walk in the light, that in Christ we find our forgiveness. We know him as our advocate before the Father and that our love to God is demonstrated in our obedience, and, and in this light will be the source of our love for one another. And for us to comprehend that life-giving anointing of the Spirit, that sealing of the Spirit that, that leads us into all truth, that, that keeps us 
from being deceived by the world system and by false teachers who, who may even rise up from among the, within the church and those from without. But what John has done, he's been building upon this purpose in his letter. If you remember from, from chapter 5, verse 13, he's wanting to bring assurance. He's wanting to bring joy to the believer in their salvation that they have received from Christ Jesus. How we are to work out, how are we to grow in our spiritual experience in the light and the holiness of God? And because John says that God is light, God who is he is holiness. God is, is truth. We understand that he is a God who is righteous. And so, verse 29, John says we, we need to ascend this new staircase, this, this spiral of truth of God is righteous. And, and it's vital for us to grasp this righteousness of God and, and its implications to us because from this point through the rest of the letter, he carries this theme of God's righteousness and what it should do, what it means for us as children of God, how we are today to look at how we are, we are completely incompatible with sin, how we are to love one another, how we are to love God, how we are to love Christ. And in this, we find the assurance of his salvation. So John wants us to see the very... The, the, the necessity, the importance of what it is to be begotten of God who is righteous. Because only by his begetting us will anyone be able to practice to live a life of righteousness, to live in a truly righteous manner so that our lives will manifest the righteousness of God. Imperfectly, yes, we still deal with sin, but in a growing, maturing manner. So John begins with what are identifying marks of God, what we call God's righteous reproduction in our soul. It's a, it's a life marked by doing and practicing righteousness. We're, we are to be always in this life practicing, doing what is right as a result of our, our new birth. But why? How? Because true believers will, will manifest righteousness in their lives because the one who saves us is righteous. This is a guarantee. It is also a test for us. If we honestly examine our lives, is there even it may be in incipient seed form, is there a pursuit, a desire for righteous living, to be pleasing to God, to know what it is that is righteous, what it is that is truth, and to embrace and take hold of those truths by the Spirit of God and apply them to our lives, to live them out. And even last week, as we looked at the resurrection of Christ in Jesus coming to forgive all of our sins, John even made this plain back in chapter 1-7 that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. And so in that precious, merciful death of Christ, his, his atoning work was to be that penal substitution for our sins, taking our sin, him paying the full penalty of our judgment, and then he applies his blood, his righteousness to our account, and we're declared, we're imputed with his righteousness. And so it's Christ's purpose in this past decisive event in regenerating us, forgiving us, justifying us, is the taking away of the penalty of sin. And then we considered our last time that the, this hope-filled promise that our now resurrected, exalted Lord and Savior will in the future save us from the very presence of sin. Chapter 2, 28 to 3, 3, we know that when he appears, we'll be like him. We'll see him just as he is. Every vestige of sin that remains in us will be taken away forever. Glorious day. The, the sheer glory and power in the work that has been accomplished for us and what is promised for the believer 
is then why John then sings out in that astonishment, in that wonder, in that awe of how great this love of the Father is, how great a quality of love the Father has for his children, how great a quantity of love he has, glorious and measureless love for his children. And this love generates, it it originates from his very nature, that the Father of heaven seeking the spiritual welfare and goodness of those he has perfectly set his love upon and begotten them as righteous children. This is yours, dear child of God. Not in a general, global, superficial sense, but a divine love set upon each individual soul, just as he individually saved us. It's a divine love that works in such a way, in such a way that brings about visible, transformative results in such unworthy recipients. And that's why John says, such as we are. This love strengthens our trust in his faithfulness to us. So with this in our minds, these these divine realities that are ours in justification and the promises of our that are ours in glorification. What we what we know of the past completed work of Christ in delivering us from the penalty of sin. And we can now look forward to that promise of being ultimately delivered from the presence of sin. Does it make you wonder what we're supposed to do in between? In these few short, vaporous days we have of life on this earth, do we give a great consideration of the work that God has determined to be accomplished in our lives? Do we give that a lot of thought? Do we give that serious consideration? What do you want accomplished in me? Right now, this is what we're going to look at in verses 4 to 10. We've we've heard him remind us with great emphasis to abide in him. John uses this phrase, abide in him, abide in him, abide in him, 15 times in this letter for specific reasons. It's a call, it's a command that we are to practice righteousness as a begotten child of God, that we have received this anointing, this seal and presence of the Spirit. We are to walk in his light as he is in the light. And all of this, beloved, is describing how we are conformed into his image, how we are to be sanctified, how we are to be further set apart unto God even more as we see that day approaching, we are to abide in him, continue to abide in him. I must ask, is this your desire and pursuit each and every day? Does this fill our prayers, not just for ourselves, but for others, to be made more like him, to live more like him? We are both, brothers and sisters, we are both called and commanded. We are equipped and commanded in the remaining days of our lives to abide in Christ in order that we may break these habits, these patterns of these ongoing recurrences of sin in our lives. Young ones, children, there is a great joy and privilege to be in Christ, to know him at a young age. So you do not have to deal with sinful habits at an old age. All the forms of sin, those recurring instances to usher in now a new habit of righteous living. It's, it's incomparable to anything in this world. To desire and delight in the holiness of God. We are to strive for this 
and strive against sin. For all true believers, when we are born again, when we are given a new heart, this new heart and a freed will to worship with new affections begins to desire that holiness, even though it may be in seed form. But as the word is opened, as it is illuminated by the Spirit, this new heart desires to know more of him, to be more like him, to embrace his righteousness, and more and more directing our affections to the matters of Christ's kingdom and his glory. Do we give ourselves to this? We must, because we have the promise Our lives have this new ethical, moral expression because of our new intimacy and our new relationship with God and begin to walk in the Spirit because of the grace in us. This is our accountability, brothers and sisters. So in this new spiral staircase of the righteousness of God, John presents this next test of the believer. Here's the test for the believer in this spiral. Our divine sonship tested by our righteous living. Our sonship, our being begotten of God, is tested by our righteous living. And John begins this in a negative way, a necessarily negative way by exposing the vile nature of sin how a begotten child of God is incompatible with the practice of sin, how a believer does not live a life characterized by sin. So the title of of my sermon, if you're taking notes, is, it's a long one, so I'll give you time to write it down. (laughs) Believer's life as a child of God and incompatibility with sin. The believer's life is a child of God and incompatibility with sin. So we're going to look at this in three main points today. We're going to look at the purpose of Christ's delivering work in opposition to sin. So point one, we're going to look at the nature of sin. Verse four and verse 8a, the first part of verse 8, the nature of sin. Then we're going to look at the power in Christ's delivering purpose. The power that's in Christ's delivering purpose. That's verses 5 to 7 and 8b, is in Baker. And then third, the abiding nature of God. The abiding nature of God, verses 9 to 10. So first, the nature of sin, verse 4. Everyone, Everyone and anyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Verse 8a, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. As I said, John necessarily starts out with this very stark contrast between what we looked at last time of the everyone practicing righteousness, marking the life of being a begotten child of God, being, being a recipient and a benefactor of his spiritual reproduction now with everyone who practices sin. And the contrast begins with John's definition of sin. It's not the most comprehensive, but it is very profound. We're going to look at this closely. Because if you, you have read and looked through the Pentateuch, Pentateuch especially Leviticus, you begin to see in the law of God just how pervasive sin is revealed in its sinfulness. How detailed, minute detail, the law of God covers every aspect of perfection that God demands from us. However, John is not speaking here of just missing the mark. He's not talking about breaking a specific law or, or of unrighteousness doing, due to the deviation from what is right. What he's saying here, that sin is an active rebellion in the heart against God's known will. 
Sin in its nature is an active, ongoing rebellion in the heart against God's known will. And his use of lawlessness here, anomia, means that sin is the spirit of, sin is the nature of lawlessness itself. It's what lies behind the rebellion. So John is is defining and saying that sin in its very nature is lawlessness, and lawlessness is the essence of sin, not the result of sin. It is the essence of sin. So that the outward sins that a sinner commits are indicative of that inward nature. And what John is getting at here is that everyone, everyone who practices, and practices here in the Greek, very important to to note this, is a present active verb, mean it's continuing. It's not letting up. It hasn't been stopped. It hasn't been defeated. And everyone who practices, who willfully continues in bondage to, in submission to what their sin nature commands, is practicing lawlessness. A heart in bondage to sin is demonstrated in their life. That inner rebellion towards God, that denial of the moral nature of God, he doesn't care what I do. The denial of the commands of God, those aren't for me. And lawlessness then is that spiritual reality of the sinner, of their inner state, not just the acts they commit, not merely those acts. So an an analogy, maybe to help you understand this a little bit better. If we look at our sins, plural, the things that we do, disobedience or the sins of the sinner, you can picture them like small islands speckled throughout the ocean. But what they are, are the mountain peaks of the continent, of the submerged continent of the nature of sin behind them of the deviant rebellion that lies behind the sins. John carries this even further in verse 8a, saying that the one who practices sin is of the devil. Of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. For anyone to assert their will as the rule of action against the will of God, to willfully disregard God, To live and engage in all manner of sinful activity, they are what John says of the devil. They are of the same rebellious nature and mindset. They are obeying Satan's willful refusal of the sovereignty and the law of God and are completely indifferent to sin. This is the essence of Satan's nature that's been evident in the first stirring in his own being. Think about how this sinfulness of sin is masked over in our day. How men attempt to wash, whitewash the tombs on the outside. Think more of the distinctions, the, the gradations of sin rather than its essential evil nature. The the sinfulness of sin is attempted to be wrapped up with bows and ribbons. Oh, it's it's just expressed as as euphemisms. Oh, it's a mistake. It's my failure. It's my personality problem. It's, It's what matters that can be excused by a cultural relativity rather than the objective truth that all, all unrighteousness is sin. We, we cannot, we, we must not look at sin or judge sin merely by its consequences. We can't just look at it because of its consequences, but view it, hate it, strive against it because of its very evil nature and satanic origin. Sin is not amoral. Sin is of the devil. He is its parent and patron. It originated with him. 
Sin is that which directly involves the culpability of the moral agent. We own our sin. Sins may be of various kinds, but all deviation from the truth, capital T, truth, is sin. Sin in its real character is the rejection of the supremacy of the moral obligation to the holy will of God. I know several of you have read Jeremiah Burroughs' book, The Evil of Evils, or The Sinfulness of Sin. He says, there is more evil in sin than in outward trouble in the world. There is more evil in sin than all the miseries and torments of hell itself. There is more evil in the least sin than there is in the greatest affliction. Sin is completely incompatible with the work and the person of Christ and the child of God. And because no one is above God's moral standards, there are no elite groups like those secessionists who left John's church and churches who embraced that, that higher knowledge, that, which was really that teaching of, of dualism where our physical body is evil, but our spirit is good. And it made them ac above accountability for their actions. No, John uses that all-inclusive everyone to accentuate this. Everyone born in sin with this same sin nature until that divine work of regeneration occurs in the heart Everyone will practice sin, and it is practicing lawlessness. But why, why does John begin here in his test of righteous living? I think he wants to give us a great heed to this first necessary step in holy living. Because for us to abide in Christ, as we should, as we are called to, as we are enabled to, we must recognize, we must recognize the true nature and wickedness of sin. It, it's not relegated to the body alone. It impacts the ethical. It impacts the moral aspects of everyone's life. It's the very nature of sin to drive the will, to deceive the heart in carrying out its evil desires. This is the bondage and the habitual life of the unbeliever. But then John quickly returns focus back to the person and work of Christ. He appeals to that knowledge of the gospel they possess, what they receive from God in righteousness in their new birth. In his appeal to the beloved, we find this, this wonderful encouragement and the power this is where we find the power to conform our lives in the reality of the gospel that we know. To live in, as Paul says, to walk and live in a manner worthy of that calling we received. And this is our second point, power in Christ's delivering purpose. The power in Christ's delivering purpose. Verse 5 to 7, he says, You know that he, Christ, he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins, and no one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of of the devil. There's quite a bit here. This is rich, but we'll walk through this together. John says, you know, brothers and sisters, recipients of the gospel, you know the anointing of the Spirit of Christ within you has given you the understanding. You know and have this understanding of the greater appreciation of why he appeared. He was made manifest in his incarnation, and this not only, not only implies his preexistence, but he came with a powerful, merciful purpose to take away our sins, to take away the sins of the elect, of his chosen children, to forgive all that we have done, what we are doing, and even what we will do, because we know, John says, we still sin. 
But John wants to remind us to exhort us in the imp importance of this past finished work, that it was through this physical necessary manifestation of Christ. He was, he was able and willing and accomplished the taking away of our sins. This is the foundation. This is the reality we live and stand upon. And Christ being the one who knew no sin, no sin was found in him. There was no potential for sin in him as he is the righteousness of God revealed in his incarnation. But it is through faith in him that we are now begotten of God where we become, as Paul says, the righteousness of God in him. So now it is, as John said last time in our last section, it's because of his imputed righteousness, because of his, we are now justified that we re receive entry into this grace, and we are enabled now by this grace to live in righteousness. We, we have this hope and this promise, again, that when he appears, we will be like him. We will not cringe in shame at his coming. And as magnificent as this is, as this addresses the greatest and deepest need of every man, woman, and child who's ever been born, forgiveness of sins and promise to see Christ, we're summoned again to remember the reality of our call and our great need to continue to abide in him. Why? So we will not be tempted and drawn away to sin against him. Because in him there is no sin. And we don't want to bring any sin into our holy community because in our sinning, we quench the spirit. We sadden the spirit of God. The communion, the precious communion, our abiding with him is broken. We're not out of fellowship. We're not taken out of Christ. But the sweetness, the joy of our fellowship is broken. And John maintains that as Christ is the righteous one, the pure one, the sinless one, he's our advocate, our atonement. He is the supreme pattern of what we as his child should be. And we can be as we continue to rest in him, abide in him, and stay in him. You remember Paul, he says in Romans 7, nothing good dwells in us. It's because our remaining sin has yet to be eradicated. It still strives to have its way. It wants to come off the cross and demand its authority and its way in us. So we've got to give very close attention to what John says now in verse 6. No one who abides in him sins. Now, before we touch on the big debate here, you mean Christians don't sin anymore once they're saved? We'll touch on that. Hear what John is asserting first, what, what propels us, what encourages us, what enables us. Anyone abiding in Christ cannot. It is an absolute impossibility that anyone abiding in Christ will keep on in a lifestyle of sinning. This is a big no one for the child of God. No one will continue in an ongoing manner of practicing, of committing sins if they truly abide in Christ, if they are truly begotten of God. The Lord in his sovereignty and his wisdom and his power will bring the necessary discipline if a child is in pursuit of sin. But this should compel us to lay hold of Christ. Is this not, word, not how we mortify our remaining sin? by our abiding in him. To know that of his, his great saving work, his delivering us from the power of, and the bondage of sin that we now experience in our submitting to him, in, in our worship of him, delighting of him in the scriptures. That this life of knowing and abiding him will keep us near to him and, and further mortify those fleshly desires that want to entertain sinning. Now, the debate of this verse revolves around the verb tense that John uses for sins. No one who abides in him sins. But we already know from chapter 1, right, that we still sin. If we say we have not sinned, we're a liar. We say we don't commit sins, we call God a liar. 
John is not promoting any sense of sinless perfection. It's also true that we stand in a position, our position is sinless before Christ, in Christ before God because of our identification with him. But we still, when we sin, we still need to rely upon, to go to immediately seek out God's forgiveness and the cleansing power of, of Christ's blood because he says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins because of Christ. But John uses this perfect active tense again in this verb, sins, to mean a genuine believer will not live in continual, ongoing lifestyle of sin. They've experienced a definitive break from the power of sin. Their old nature has been crucified with him in order that their body, our bodies of sin, might be done away with so that we will no longer be slaves to sin, but now we are to present our members the members of our body as slaves to righteousness in Jesus Christ. So John explains this abiding even further for us. He wants us to grasp this. First, he he brings it out in a negative sense in the last part of verse 6b. What was the reality of those who left the church? And he alludes to the reality of those abiding believers still here. He says, no one who sins has seen him or knows him. No one who sins, still same present active verb, who continues in sin, has seen him or knows him. Because if anyone is living who has a habitual course of sin in their life, does not truly know the Lord, They are not saved. They will be trying to and striving to be free from sin apart from the strength of the Lord's Spirit. They've never truly seen him. They do not know him. But these two verbs again, seen and know, should be considered what is missing in the impenitent sinner. But what is true for the believer in experience Both of these verbs, seen and known, are in the perfect tense. They're, again, this ongoing, personal, saving relationship. And and to see Christ, to see him entails that vision that only comes about by faith. This spiritual insight, what Hebrews describes for us is faith. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not physically seen. And John, even though he literally did see Christ, he emphasizes here for us to behold and see the true nature and purpose of Christ by faith, to gaze upon him by faith in his word. For if we have seen Christ for who he is and embrace that redemptive work, we will continue abiding in him. We will be transformed Our remaining sin will be mortified and put to death. But it also requires for us to know. He knows in like manner is to grow in that personal dynamic relationship, a knowing based on the word, based on the word of God and our experience as we walk with him. This, This is our subjective taking possession of who Christ is. Our knowing, this is, this is active knowledge. This is what something we obtain from the Word of God, something that is applied by the Spirit, not something in our natural man, our natural incl- inclinations. But we continue to know Him, to grow, as it says, Paul says, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And just remembering the, the perils that's going on in the church with John and his his little children as he addresses them. He does so again here with, with very tender affection. But hear this, hear this warning and discernment he gives us in verse 7, which, which helps us, enables us to rely on Christ even more. He says in verse 7, little children, believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, 
Make sure no one deceives you. Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Christ, is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. We are, are we not, children of God? If you have put your faith and trust in Christ, you are a begotten child of God, but we are also sheep. Many of you now understand as parents just how credulous children are, how easy they can be tricked and deceived. You only need to take a quick glimpse in the world to see the corruption, the evil that is happening around us to know this. But even the child of God has the potential to be deceived. And John warns us, beware, be careful of that attractive tale given by that attractive person. Keep looking to Christ. Believe your Savior. Trust in your Lord. Don't be so quick to believe someone else who may have some higher knowledge. But it, we just observed for, for a while they would give evidence that their lives are not righteous. They're not in Christ, just as they saw in the church. They left us, and because they left us, they proved to us they're not in the Lord. So believe God's word. Hear his voice. Trust in it. Stand upon it. Close your ears to any antichrist spirit or ideal, any other than Christ, any greater than Christ, anything better than Christ teaching. And know, too, that with that precious anointing of the Spirit, the truth of what John, Jesus says in John 10, 5, is, is yours as sheep. What, what did Jesus say to us there? A stranger, they, we, simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. We understand the true voice as we abide in him and his word. For those born of God, being now righteous in Christ, we will bear the fruit that the, of the Spirit's anointing in you. Day by day, word upon word, truth upon truth, there will be manifestation of that fruit that of God's righteousness in you. This is the outward evidence that we are to discern of those who claim of being righteous in what they know or what they say, but in reality, they continue to live in sin just as the world because we'll know a tree by its fruit. That tree will bear the fruit of its kind. So children of the living God continue to look to Christ. Look to Christ. Verse 8b, for the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Christ manifested himself in the flesh. God came down to man and in his incarnation initiated his first fatal blow to the works of Satan. And if he, the Son of God, came taking on flesh, appearing as that precious infant lying in the feed trough, that certainly the Almighty has not given up our nature to be the prey of sin. Christ living upon this earth was also his means of destroying the works of the devil. Think how numerous the people there were possessed, severely encumbered, tormented by demonic spirits, Yet it was a simple spoken word of Christ that delivered the power to send those spirits into the swine. His preaching, his eternal truth, his labor in establishing the foundation of his bride, the church, was to expose and refute all the deceptive poison the serpent had put in the people in sin. And it was the Lord's passion in his suffering, his dying, that destroyed all that Satan had built. All of the dragon's efforts to deceive and destroy God's creation, mankind in making man offensive to God so that God must now punish him for his sin. Do you see the deception of Satan? And in the wrath of God against sin to forever alienate man from God. 
But our Lord came, praise God, Christ came, taking our place, destroying that final work of alienation in the judgment of God. He bore upon himself our sin, our deserved wrath of the Father. He, being the very judge, came to stand where the criminal should stand and is now counted with the transgressors. He bore the wrath as the beloved of God, suffered an eternal punishment so that we may, by destroying Satan's schemes and works, destroying sin and its power, that we may now be reconciled to God, freed from the bondage of sin, no more to be an offense to heaven because of his boundless merit. And now with his ascension to glory, his sitting with all power, all authority at the right hand of the Father, he continues, continues today to destroy the works of Satan and his kingdom by the Spirit of Christ himself through the proclamation of the gospel, destroying the works of darkness in the heart of man as the Spirit of God brings new life that power of revealing himself in a sin-bound man, woman, and child, and now bringing, bringing to us, instilling in us his own resurrection life, a life now knowing of God, loving God, worshiping God, being transformed by God through his word and spirit for that glorious day, that day of sinless, Satanless eternity. And to think about that Christ has prepared the lake of fire for Satan himself, where death and Hades, Satan will all be cast, as well as those who do not know God, who are not known by him, who do not have a love of the truth so as to be saved, those who will not love his appearing. So John brings this theme, this paragraph, to a very logical conclusion. His focus is not on how one is born of God, even though this is the second of ten of his references of being born of God. John's focus here is these very two searching statements he makes and brings us to our last point, that abiding nature of God, that abiding nature of God. No one, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Two searching statements. The true believer does not continue in sin, and the believer cannot go on sinning. John is not saying anyone born of God is incapable of sinning. John will not contradict the truth or uh, of our remaining sin nature and what the fruit of that nature bears. We still sin, sadly. But John is emphasizing the believer's reality as those now being fathered by God is a life that does not practice sin. It's no longer our course in life. It's no longer our habit or the tenor of our lives. Our new character will not continue in a settled habit of sin. Even though there is sin in all that we do, we now understand the life and the love that has been poured into our souls by the Spirit of God. We now experience a loathing, a, a detesting, and a hating of sin. And we are called to exert every facet, exercise every means of grace to flee from it and to repent of it. Because God's new nature in us cannot sin, it never sins. The Spirit of God in us can never sin or commune with sin. But we know by experience that our old remaining nature in us will sin. We'll try to gain ground in our minds and in our lives and our members of our body, but because Christ is now ruling and reigning our new heart, he advocates for us in the presence of the Father, pleading our righteousness and cleansing us in our confession and repentance. 
in order that sin will no longer reign in our mortal body and so that we will not be led away by its lusts. And it's because this precious seed, his seed, that abides in us, it's been planted in us through the gospel in the child of God. This is the promise and the power that that new nature has been implanted in us. It's the very seed of life-giving power. It's, it's experienced in that deep, radical, inward transformation, which according to the first promise of the gospel is that nature of Christ, which removes our enmity with God and now brings enmity between us and Satan. He certainly isn't our buddy. So it's this life-giving seed of God that exerts in our hearts that, that internal drive toward holiness, toward Christ-likeness. It will bear that fruit of Christ and his righteousness. So we, beloved, we cannot go on. We cannot continue in sin, and we're enabled to do so. It's a merciful, precious, life-giving, holy power that has been bestowed in our hearts. And now we can clearly see what John says in verse 10. There's a sharp, clear division in mankind. Nowhere is found a third class, a middle ground. We're either children of God or we are children of the devil. He says in verse 10, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God nor the one who does not love his brother. By this redemption promise fulfilled in the child of God, there's found this obvious distinction, this clarity between these only two classes of people, either in Adam or in Christ. You're in God or you're of the devil. And hear how precious, how serious this is. If there is not a clear evident, demonstrative life of practicing righteousness. Not perfection. Practicing and pursuing righteousness according to what is found in the Word of God. That person is not of God. And this is such a sharp, sharp distinction that John gives, especially from this gentle, loving pastor that he could make in regarding all of mankind. But he must and he does make such a stinging distinction because, because, as I said, there's no middle ground, there's no gray area. And he dismisses any theory, any teaching to flatter the undecided. There's no indecision. You are in Christ or you are of the devil. We're not all children of God because we're born into this world and we live in the United States of America or we have a bunch of money or we have Christian parents or we do a lot of good things. We're only born again into people of God by giving heed to hearing, listening, obeying the gospel call that you are a sinner. You are guilty before a most holy God who will judge you one day. And unless you look to his son, And what he did on your behalf on the cross, who can only one who can save you from your sin and from the wrath yet to come from hell, to be thrown into the same lake of fire with Satan himself. Come to him, cry out to him, ask him to save you, to give you new life, to know him. He will give you the purpose of why you exist. And that existence, that purpose, is to know him and to glorify him. And the last part of verse 10, this is John's segue, his transition into the next test. As we will, Lord willing, continue to ascend this this staircase of God is righteous. Next time we're going to hear John's test of brotherly love. This is an evidence of the righteousness of God being born in us. But let me ask us some quick questions of application before we go. How do we purify ourselves? How do we practice this righteousness of God? 
Seriously, simply, yet powerfully, we look to Christ. He, he is our example. We, we plead with him, give me all that there was in Christ. Help me to cast off what is offensive. Put it to death. Put on more of him as we commune together, as I read and learn about him, as I pray to him. Submit yourself to the cutting power and healing power of the word of God in the ministry of the word. Avail yourself to the means of grace he's given us. Ask the Lord by his spirit to give you a tender conscience. Ask him to make you shiver at every hint of sin. And in keeping your eye to God and to heaven, care more about what God says about you than what other men do. And be a beacon of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray, speak, evangelize, exhort in truth, exercise all the one another's in Scripture. And considering that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil and the sin that Satan brought into this world and into our lives, and he has accomplished this, Christ has accomplished this, and we know that day will come when our transformation, our transfiguration will be complete. Aren't these great promises in the finished work able to cause us to strive after holiness, to seek after sanctification? And even despite our failures and our setbacks, let us be the righteous man who may fall seven times, but he rises again in the strength and hope in Christ. Amen? What sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking and hastening the coming of the day of God? Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, your truth. We thank you for the righteousness that has been begotten in us, that has been birthed in us by Christ. Father, enable us, stir us, fan the flame of fire and zeal in us to continue pursuing that righteousness that is only found in him and enable us by your grace and by your spirit, Lord, so that you will be glorified. You will be praised and honored and your name will be exalted among the nations because of your children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.